<laughs> so 2018-2019, I ran a series in Düsseldorf called a Philosophy Meetup uh, as part of presenting ideas from my book series, Philosophy for Heroes. Uh, it's about knowledge, it's about um, epistemology, how do we arrive at knowledge, it's about language, it's about um, physics, it's about quantum mechanics, it's about evolution, it's about everything uh, I discussed online. So whenever I have a discussion, I usually take some notes and eventually they will find, um, find a way into a book. Uh, the most current book I just released is Does Your Brain Need You? And that's basically a summary of the second book about evolution and the first book about uh, how can we know something about the world plus uh, neuroscience and um, the entire topic of consciousness. And for the course, it, it will run uh, for about 10 or 12 meetups where I go through the entire book. book. Um, nope. uh, we will have a whole range of topics, so from the um, history of evolutionary thought, so um, what about the past, how did they think about evolution, and uh, how did uh, attention evolve? So how can we focus on uh, a certain topic or a certain object? And then we will continue on the history, evolutionary history of, um, of ourselves, of primates, and discover how the brain works. So this, this guy will accompany us in our discussions and we will open up uh, what's, what's inside. And also this guy will accompany us um, because we needed basically to think about consciousness because when we think about uh, a little uh, puppet, uh, we attribute consciousness to it. Like if, he, if, if I move it in a certain way, uh, we assume, okay, it's, it's something, something inside of that being that uh, acts like that. Okay, um, continuing on, um, we will then uh, really go deep into the ideas of, uh, uh, of the brain, especially how the whole visual system works, so, and especially also how um, um, the uh, optical illusions work and what that says about uh, the um, uh, about consciousness, how we experience our body. I mean, if we, let's say, grab uh, a glass of water, the question is how do we intuitively know how to move our muscles? So that is the, the body schema. Then we go into the theory of mind. Um, that's basically how do I know what you know? So for example, if um, uh, I'm calling you on the telephone and um, I'm holding up a, a toy and ask you, okay, what, what do you think about that? Uh, without the theory of mind, I'm not aware that you're not aware that I'm holding it up. The point is uh, I have to take another person's point of view. Um, that, that concludes basically the, the, the first part that, that will uh, continue for about yeah, six, six meetings. So each, each line here is, will be one, uh, one meetup. And for the second series, we will go deep into philosophy. What, do the, uh, what, did, what did people in uh, ancient times think about uh, consciousness, about awareness, about attention? and what different uh, types of theories of consci consciousness are there. So there is the Eastern view, uh, there's the Western view, there's the idea of a separate mind and body, and there's uh, an idea um, of everything is consciousness, and there are ideas everything is material, and there are different types in between. Um, and then we will try to look for it. So where where is the consciousness? What is that? feeling we have, okay, it's somewhere, somewhere inside of our head, 
that there is a consciousness or a self why why is it located there why, why does it have a location and uh, based on our findings we will uh, come to some sort of uh, loop of consciousness so when we when we are thinking we will have uh, we will we will think in loops and that is also represented in the in the brain so that will, will accompany us that topic and then we will go into model building how the brain builds models of the world and uh, deals with those models so for example when we have to anticipate what will happen uh, we will have to use a model for example uh, if i give you a present i need to have a model of you how to know how you will react to that present um, and at the very end we will have uh, we will really go deep into the so-called attention and awareness schema theory that will really explain okay what is what we call consciousness and uh, as a as a basically workshop we will build we will build this guy and make it make him make him very smart make him so smart that he can uh, also do philosophy so that is that is basically the overview of the course. Uh, so and I'm checking for a question. I think I muted you. Uh, so if you have some questions now, um, otherwise I just say uh, hello, Axel. Hello, uh, Sapi. If you want to say anything, maybe hello. But you don't have to. Okay. So, and if if you have any questions, just uh, put it into in the chat, or just uh, well, if you use video, just uh, um, use the video, or uh, just um, yeah, try to try to contact me in other ways. Okay. So. About myself, just uh, if you don't know me yet, uh, I'm Clemens Lode. I studied organic computing back, uh, well, 10 years ago uh, at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Um, here are my contact details. I will also put them in the, in the YouTube video. Um, I also studied uh, mathematics and uh, computer science. So organic computing is mostly about evolution. So basically evolution is my focus uh, in, what was my focus in my studies. Since then, I'm working in the IT industry, software architecture, and I'm writing, um, I'm writing uh, the books. So the first question is, are the books available in German? Uh, the first book is in, available in German. It's, it's called uh, Erkenntnis. Um, the other books are yet in English simply because there is not enough um, uh, demand yet and I don't have time currently to translate them but just put me if you have people interested in the topic just uh, let me know also you can also read all basically all the articles of the books on my uh, website uh, meaning you could use Google Translate so uh, besides uh, working in IT, I do uh, well publishing. So if you're interested in, in book publishing or so, you can just contact me. And the books I wrote is, well, basically Philosophy for Heroes and the newest book, Does Your Brain Need You? And I wrote two books about project management and how to write a book. And of course, you can check out the YouTube channel if you're in, in Zoom or you can also support, support me on Patreon. So we already were there. So um, now what is to, to give the whole thing uh, um, a framework? What questions do we want to uh, answer? Um, as, as the title implies, um, no. uh, does your brain need you? What, what is that you we always talk, talk about? What is that I we always talk about? Um, so here's, a, here's an uh, ape 
uh, looking into the uh, lake and uh, asking, okay, what, what is that that I'm seeing here? Also, the question is, what do you need in terms of, of, of brain capability to actually recognize you in the mirror image? So, and, and we could ask, okay, who was the first person or ape that looked into the lake and said, hey, that's, that is me, that, that, that is me. And, and what made that ape different to um, other, other apes? So that will be answered in the course of this. Um, of this course. So there's another question. Did I write a, um, a program to simulate StarCraft build orders? Yes, uh, I did in the past. Uh, it was about uh, an application of evolutionary algorithm, algorithms. So I'm, um, you can ask me a question about that later in the QA. Okay, um, back to the topic. Um, the one, one, one big question in philosophy is also why? I mean, couldn't we just be... Uh, people who don't have that inner experience. I mean, just machines going our daily business and what makes us different to people who are just, uh, who, who have that inner experience. Uh, that is, that is a, a big question because if you can answer that, then we could uh, test if someone has consciousness or has that, that idea of self. And we will uh, deal with it with the Turing test or a variation of the Turing test uh, later during the course. So that is also a very, very exciting question that we have to address. So continuing, um, as I said, I divided the course in two parts. The first part is really focused on the neuroscience. So we first have to know, okay, what specific parts of the brain are there, how do they work? And once we have that basic basic uh, foundation, we can really ask the more challenging questions about how consciousness works. Okay. Yeah, and as uh, Richard P. Feynman said, our imagination is stretched to the utmost, not as in fiction, uh, not as in fiction to imagine things which are not really there, but just to comprehend those things which are there. Because if you look back, consciousness is a topic uh, accompanying uh, humanity since thousands of years. And uh, most religions are about a certain interpretation of consciousness. Yeah, I already introduced uh, the first part. Uh, and today we will really focus here on the evolutionary thought and the basics of evolution. So we need to know how evolution works to understand how the brain creates creativity and how it was possible for a brain to evolve. So that is basically the um, scientific foundation you need. Uh, evolution is, is the key. Uh, maybe I'm biased in that regard, but uh, I think it is very important to know how all that came to place. So one moment, I have to switch here. So. Okay, then we will start with the history of evolutionary thought. So it's, it's not just that people uh, like in the 18th century, like uh, Darwin just said, okay, hey, now I have solved the puzzle and that's it. Instead, uh, evolution, um, was always the topic since uh, Arist Aristotle and even earlier. And they all had like a little puzzle piece how it works. And uh, I mean, the Darwin proposed the, the final theory of, of evolution, but he built upon a lot of other philosophers and scientists. And most of the time, uh, the, the foundation was really to gather a lot of data how um, different uh, uh, what different animals there are um, and as Carl Sagan said uh, science is a collaborative enterprise spanning the generations we remember those who prepared the way seeing for them also 
So whatever scientific discovery you have, it is always like a whole tree um, where one uh, builds upon the other. And you have to basically discover the entire tree to understand the, the theory at the end. Um, without the, the knowledge about the history of the um, theory of evolution, it is hard to imagine how Darwin could have, could have ca uh, come up with it. So, hello to the new people in the chat. So, and uh, the interesting thing is, it's there's not just an uh, evolution of the evolutionary thought about evolution, but to, to go full meet meta, there's also an evolution of the evolution. Uh, so evolution itself uh, changed its own rules by introducing a variety of mechanisms. Uh, let's let's take a take a quick look at the uh, history of the planet. Uh, so 3.8 billion years ago, the Earth cools down, uh, the meteoroid bombardment begins to end, and the first protocells with RNA RNA appear. And uh, one possible theory is that deep sea thermal winds provide the first basic metabolism for the first cells. Uh, this is discussed in the and my second book continuum. So if you're interested in the origin of life, I recommend uh, this one. There's also articles on my website on that, but uh, it's, it's more, of course, more comprehensive in the PDF or in the, in the book. But uh, origin of life, we just assume, okay, uh, life uh, developed here or somewhere at, in that uh, part. So then uh, 2.45 billion years ago, there was the great oxidation event. Um, so basically uh, oxygen is a very deadly gas actually, uh, because it is very reactive, uh, chemically, chemically reactive, and it caused a lot of uh, basically cell death until the cells adapted to the different atmosphere. Uh, then around 2 billion years ago, we have uh, specialized cells with geno and phenotype. So be uh, differentiation between the uh, genetic information and the actual life form. So there's a stronger differentiation. So the code and the actual life form. Uh, 1.5 billion years ago, multicellular life uh, appears and 1.2 billion years ago sexual reproduction and crossing over of DNA appears. So that is a very big step in the evolution of evolution because now uh, genetic information could cross from one organism to the other and can be recombined. So that is a huge, uh, had a huge impact on the way um, the animals adapted. Then 500 million years ago, uh, the adaptive immune system appeared. Um, the adaptive immune system is basically uh, nature using a small scale evolution inside the organism to fight uh, a patch of, uh, like a virus or a bacteria. Um, so basically small cells within the organism uh, try to adapt to the uh, cell structure of the uh, of the bacteria or the the hull of the of the virus, and uh, there are like in a in a small evolutionary race who can adapt faster to it. Uh, that's also an interesting topic that we will not talk today. Uh, talk about today. It's also in the in the second book about uh, how uh, the um, immune system developed and how there's an evolutionary race between, uh, between the two. So then continuing on, 220 million years ago, mammals appear, 100 million years ago, first primates, 65 million years ago, uh, asteroid, big event, the Cretaceous Palutine extinction event, and with major climate shifts and most of the dinosaurs became mostly extinct uh, except of course the birds and it was the rise of the mammals. 
uh, because they um, were, were better adapt to the uh, to the new environment. And about eight, eight million years ago, the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees and gorillas. Uh, of course, that that number is uh, could could be a little bit different. And 2.5 million years ago, humans appear. So of course, they are not just appear out of out of out of nothing. But that that's about the point where we say, okay, that that was before we were apes and then we were humans. So that's a little bit uh, shady, of course. Um, that's a little uh, the 300 years ago. That could be different. Could be earlier. Um, basically, um, a so-called Darwin machine. Uh, in the brain uh, was used. It could be maybe maybe a lot earlier, but that is that that is one suggestion. So it could be like million years ago or five million years ago, but that is basically the the year point where I put it. The basic idea is um, we had the idea of evolution in the immune system. Um, an immune system fights the pathogen by adapting to the uh, to the to the surface, and we have the same thing in the brain uh, with uh, thought patterns competing with each other, uh, and thus creating creativity. So that will always be it will also be a topic uh, in the upcoming meetups. Basically, how we can uh, be cre just as creative as nature with all its life forms. We use our brain to be just as creative using uh, evolutionary algorithms. And of course, also a major step is uh, the development of writing because suddenly we no longer have to learn everything and fill our brain with, with everything with each generation, but we can basically save up whatever we have learned and uh, give it to the next generation. And that basically led to an explosion of, uh, of human evolution. Um, then continuing on, uh, 2000 years ago, uh, first mechanical computer, so that is of course important. Um, it was uh, for, for astronomy. So basically you could calculate uh, a certain uh, stellar um, position with it. Yeah, you have to look it up if, if you want to. There's also a good documentation about how it worked. Uh, I can link it. And about a thousand years ago, um, scientific method was developed. So how can we not just write everything down we know, but uh, write it down in a coherent way? So, okay. And uh, of course, uh, well, 1543 is scientific uh, revolution. Uh, you might have uh, seen the picture of Newton with his prism. Uh, with, the, with the light shining through and we have the theory of evolution with Darwin 1859 that is of course a point and about 100 years ago theory of relativity and quantum theory 1950s theory of DNA uh, and we have the first digital life uh, so-called cellular automata and well, first humans on the on the moon uh, on the moon and development of the internet uh, 1970s uh, theory of um, artificial immune systems. Uh, wait, wait, those are later. Theory of adaptive immune systems. So we, we are beginning to understand how evolution works in our body. And 1980s theory of neural Darwinism is published. So we understand how our brain becomes creative. And 1990s artificial life is created on the computer. So basically, uh, you have a you have a, have a memory and you put in a simple simple program that does nothing but uh, copy itself and after a while of some mutation uh, other life forms artificial life forms develop so continue on so we had had the whole thing okay how how did uh, evolution on uh, Earth developed the different parts, the understanding of, of the evolution. And now what about the theory of evolution? So we have at the end, of course, uh, as we said, uh, 1859 theory of evolution. 
theory of evolution with Darwin. But uh, way before, uh, like 2,600 years ago, the first people thought about, okay, uh, how, how does the world, how did the world came to be? So. And uh, before that world is basically a world of uh, Homer's Odyssey, basically with uh, gods that had had some temper and some uh, and a lot of relationships, and people couldn't really make make sense of it. Um, so they thought, okay, they're basically the victim of some some deity that that had some idea how 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 the world should work, how how harvest how how much harvest you have, etc. Et uh, so really, only with Thales, at least in a, in a, in a, in a written form, um, we have a first idea, okay, um, there is at least some theory how, how everything came to be. Uh, Thales basically said that there's a first principle of, of nature and everything comes from water or is water. Uh, and that is close what actually happened with the first life forms, first cells coming from water. Uh, next one, uh, Anaximander, 610 to 547. Um, and he stated, okay, natural phenomena can actually be observed and understood through that. Uh, I think he was the one that also looked at uh, tectonic changes like, okay, how did mountains develop? And Empedocles, um, he actually had some sort of theory evolution of evolution, namely organisms lacking properties survive, disappear from nature. Um, so I always use uh, use an example like uh, you have a, um, you have a river with, with stones uh, in them, and those stones that uh, consist of material that are easily um, dissolved by water, um, uh, they they disappear. So at the after a few thousand years in the in the river, you will only find stones that are uh, kind of immune against the the flow of water, of course, or, or, or relatively resistant against the flow of water. So Aristotle, he was basically a natural scientist. He did a lot of uh, research and and uh, cataloging of uh, animals and plants, and he basically discovered it's not just random animals in, in random environments, but he could could state that the animals had specific properties that are adapted to the environment. Oops. And no, so, okay. I shouldn't use the mouse. So, Lucretius, uh, and he stated, okay, um, we have discovered already so much about the universe, I say, okay, it is purely mechanistic. Without supernatural influence, we can describe it, even if we don't know yet everything, but uh, that is, that is, the, that is my, my theory. Uh, Augustine of Hippo, uh, he stated new species can develop, because, I mean, um, if you don't have much history, you, do, you don't know uh, what other species could there be. Um, and he stated, okay, after a while, new species could develop, maybe. Then the scientist Al Burini, uh, also close to, to Darwin's theory, successful properties are inherited to the next generation. So um, if, uh, if an animal has certain properties that, are, that is adapted to the environment, you will find those properties with a higher probability in the next generation. And that is basically already the, the theory of evolution. Um, then also uh, Nasir al-Din Tusi, I probably don't, don't have it uh, correctly pronounced. Uh, humans are but a middle step of an evolutionary stairway. Of course, that is a little bit touched with uh, religion like or, or purpose that, that we are still evolving uh, to, a, to a higher form. So that is touched somewhat with a... With a higher purpose. Then Thomas uh, of Aquinas, uh, animals have a potential to develop into new species. So it's basically the same that uh, Augustine of Hippo says, but it's, uh, I mean, it's not that they always read each other's books uh, during their time. So sometimes it is just rediscovered. 
it's just Thomas uh, Aquinas is a, is a very important uh, philosopher or church uh, person and had, he had a lot of influence so that is a that is of course a huge um, a huge point he is making here then again René Descartes again universe is mechanistic here you see again okay uh, he's basically just repeating what Lucretius or was already saying and of course if you uh, claim or can claim the universe is mechanistic then you have to find a way to uh, explain uh, how species can develop so they don't just plop out of plop out of nothing then uh, Benoit de May uh, humans developed from animals that came out of water so we have a combination out of uh, those different different uh, ideas from before uh, maybe he looked at our our webs here and said hey we are somewhat adapted to water and we maybe had some aquatic past that is that is one one theory uh, and then this guy, you might have might have seen him. Again, if you have any questions, just just put it put it in the chat. I look there. Uh, this guy, um, Darwin and the evolution of Darwin, basically, uh, as a young person and during during his time. So he uh, did a lot of uh, traveling around the world. Voyage of the um, he, he did a. A voyage around the around the world and like Aristotle he uh, catalogued a lot and with that he basically built trees I mean like knowledge trees he built trees uh, of, of relationships between the between the different animals and of course he also had access to the previous thinkers thoughts and he combined everything that that came up to that um, and b you have probably heard the idea of survival of the fittest um, so uh, properties that uh, of, of uh, that help the individual animal to adapt to its environment are inherited to the next generation um, and now let's let's look a little bit closer at the theory of evolution and one important point is um, by Melvin Connor. Still, it needs to be said that the, that the light of evolution is just that, a means of seeing better. It is not a description of all things human, nor is it a clear prediction of what will happen next. So um, the theory of, of evolution is not okay, it explains this or that, but it is a way of thinking. It means, okay, whatever you have now has a history so it's uh, it's never just it never just fell out of the sky and it's just there uh, but you always have have to look at its history and how it developed to get there and that thinking is you can apply universally i mean it's not just uh, in, in in biology but basically all systems be it political or personal or how is it possible that a house stands here and not there? You always have a, have a history and you have to look at that history. So, and the theory of evolution um, is to better understand um, why an organism has certain properties. Uh, because again, it's not just, the uh, bird has not just wings, but it has wings for a specific purpose. Because if that purpose wasn't there, it uh, would eventually, uh, through a mutation or so, be no longer there in one of the later generations. And that generation would have no disadvantage. It would maybe even save the energy for the, for the wings or so uh, and live just as happy as, as, the, as his or her uh, predecessors. Um, what, what Darwin found or what, what was later formalized as the three uh, properties of evolution are three things. So whenever you have those three things available in a system and it doesn't matter if it's biological, if it's thought patterns, if it's, uh, if it's a game or if it's a political system or a system of government, it's always the same. If you have those three uh, properties you have uh, evolution going on 
and uh, the very basic prerequisite is a system needs to be able to make copies of itself. So uh, uh, let's say a stone is not will, will probably not evolve into into something else um, because it can't make copies of itself. So it needs to somehow make copies of itself. And we have that with, uh, of course, cells on the one hand, but we also have it with ideas, for example. So if I tell you a story and uh, you, you listen to the story and tell it to someone else, then it's already fulfilled. Okay, the first, first uh, element of evolution is already fulfilled. Uh, and let's, let's look at the second one. There needs to be a variability in the gene pool, for example, through mutations. Um, so, um, if every organism that just just makes copies of itself makes perfect copies and everything is identical, then there is no evolution. Uh, for example, you have that with uh, on the uh, molecular scale. I mean, you don't have evolution on uh, atoms. Like there are no no better atoms today than there were a million years ago. There is some change like a movement towards more stable atoms. For example, you don't have um, oxygen and uh, hydrogen just flying around, but they uh, build water. Um, so because water is more stable than, uh, um, uh, than, than the rest, but uh, that, that is it. So there's no, uh, there's also no way of copying. Of course, atoms don't copy, copy themselves, um, but you see, some some kind of difference, d different types of atoms or different types of molecules have to be there. Otherwise, there is no, no evolution. And um, the important point, what we will, we will get to later, is that muta mutations are not necessarily the, the driver of evolution. So it's not just like, OK, now I have a mutation, now I have wings and then I fly around. But it's more like mutations create a variability in the gene pool. And depending on the environment, certain parts of the uh, gene pool of the of the population uh, are selected. So it's, it's not just like okay, it's always the same, always the same environment, and then suddenly one uh, one member of the species has a mutation and then flies to the flies to the sky or something like that. that that's usually not how it goes. Um, that is, that is the second and the third point. Systems need to be able to operate for their own individual advantage. Um, so if you have uh, different different cells and they uh, gather nutrients from the, from the environment, um, then uh, it is easy, of course, for one organism to just take the take the uh, take the nutrients from another from another organism, and that. Um, I mean, the, the point here is that uh, if an organism is, is better at uh, getting those nutrients, then that better technique or that better, better genetic structure has to be reward, rewarded. Otherwise, um, it's eventually just again lost through another mutation. We will, we will get to those again um, and looking at a few examples. So just checking the questions. Okay. So, hello, not that much. So, I guessed. So, so. so hello, Davy. So then we have mutations. So uh, as I said, mutations um, are not necessarily the driver of uh, of evolution, and we have to look at this more closely because I mean that is that is usually uh, being said. Okay, um, so the question is, to whom? Oh, interesting. interesting. To whom are, uh, am I teaching? Uh, this uh, stream is also um, streamed towards YouTube. Okay, 
Ähm, Theory of Evolution. So, we were already here. So, mutations. So, what is a mutation? Because uh, the question is, um, why, why aren't uh, mutations the driver? Uh, yes, only five people are watching on YouTube, but that's fine with me because I will also put this video on YouTube for later to, to watch later. Okay. Um, so continuing. So the question was, what, what does it mean here with the vari vari variability through mutations? And why aren't mutations the driver of evolution? Because it is the usual, uh, usual topic for movies or, uh, <laughs> uh, or in, in general. Uh, no. Okay, that is currently not the topic we are currently discussing. Something else. Okay. The genotype is a system that is the blueprint for the phenotype. We already discussed that. So we have the, the we have the data that is the genotype, and we have the, uh, uh, we have the data that is the genotype, and we have the uh, phenotype that is the actual being. So this one is the. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, we have some spin going. So. Um, that one is the phenotype and basically the genetic data making up that ape is the genotype. So here we have the phenotype is the actual body of a life form. Changes in the phenotype generally do not have effects on the genotype. So if I uh, put a hat on the on the ape. Uh, it doesn't uh, really change the genetic structure of the ape, or put a put a, put a lipstick on, or uh, or if the ape injures his arm or something like that, that doesn't change the genotype. And a mutation is a change of the genotype of a life form. This change can, but does not necessarily have consequences for the phenotype. So uh, maybe the genetic structure changes, but it could be uh, like a dormant gene or an um, inactive gene that doesn't change the, the appearance and might only appear then in the apes uh, children. So. Okay. Um, so then um, the question was now what what happens with with mutations um, in general it is not that like a mutation gives you superpowers uh, in general all mutations from the from the perspective of the um, of, of nature mutations are bad because uh, the organism is already adapted to the environment i mean the organism's parents were adapted to the environment and also uh, the, the individual um, life was adapted to the, to the environment and um, why, why change something that is already working. Uh, so usually mutations are bad and uh, actually um, the, the cells do everything in their power to prevent mutations like repair mechanisms, etc. This is a little bit different like in viruses. Uh, some viruses really uh, say, okay, I don't care, just, just, just do a copy and if there are mutations, sure, those, those copies won't survive and etc. But I do so many copies, it doesn't really matter. That is, for example, in the influenza virus and also in the HIV virus. They don't really do uh, copy uh, um, uh, uh, they don't really fix their uh, fi uh, fix their copying errors. And then of course they mutate faster and this might help them to overcome the immune system of the individual uh, target host. 
So and but but then I mean what what are the use? I mean there there are still mutations going on like a like, like a little bit. What what are the use of these mutations? And uh, evolutionarily speaking, the use of these mutations simply to allow a population of animals or plants or so uh, to have a little bit of variability. And for example, if there is a virus uh, also attacking that, uh, that, that group of animals or plants or so, some might survive. And they give their uh, ability to have at least some mutations to the next generation. So there is a, there's a like from the one direction, there's a push, okay, we, um, uh, we need to have as few mutations as possible simply to provide better copies. And on the other hand, we need, uh, we need to have a little bit, just a little bit mutations just to have that variability and uh, to survive the next generation. I mean, or survive uh, like, like uh, viruses or, or other attacks. Because if you imagine like everyone has the same genes in, the, uh, in, a, in a population, then if there is an illness that affects a single one, then everyone is affected and, and the whole population dies out. Um, another concept you have to understand besides mutation and phenotype and genotype is the fitness landscape. It's, um, it's a little bit strange concept. Um, it is basically the sum of all environmental influences. So you have, um, uh, for example, um, a high, high uh, uh, water pressure, so uh, animals that live uh, far uh, in, in the depth of the ocean, um, then uh, they have to adapt to that. And animals that have, uh, that do well with the high water pressure, they uh, have a higher probability of surviving. Or uh, yeah, not, not, a, not an example basically from nature, but basically from physics. Uh, if you're sifting sand, a riddle screen lets small particles of sand fall through while larger stones are retained. Uh, so basically the fitness landscape is uh, you need to be large and if you're large you don't fall through the uh, uh, through the uh, screen and basically there's there's no um, no organism that is uh, better than, than the other organism in, in any way. You, you can never say one organism is better than the other uh, organism, uh, only in the context of the fitness landscape. So uh, a fish isn't very good on land. I mean, if, if all oceans would dry out, the fish isn't very, very good in that, uh, in that environment. Vice versa, if everything is ocean, uh, we would, would uh, struggle because we are not adapted to living in the ocean. So that's, it's always the context of the fitness landscape. And this will, this will um, be important then later when we talk about human creativity, because there the fitness landscape is our memories or our personality or our current, uh, are we currently feeling if we have hunger or something like that. So if you imagine um, an thought pattern that um, uh, is about uh, how to get a burger or how, how to get food, um, that thought pattern will be more successful in a fitness landscape where you have, uh, you have hunger or a lack of nutrients. Um, um, so you can, can imagine different thoughts in different fitness landscapes have a different uh, survival probability. So again, uh, the, the principle of evolution is not limited to organisms. It can be applied to uh, ideas, to thoughts, uh, to systems, uh, and even to, to artificial uh, intelligence, to artificial life. Um, so uh, we had, if we, if we go back, we had um, systems uh, need to be able to operate for their own individual advantage. And for that, um, I, I mean, that, that is the one. And we, have, we had uh, variability. So these two are reflected in the fitness landscape and the selection. Um, so we already talked about fitness landscape. So uh, 
some organisms are better adapted to a certain, a certain environment. And the opposite of that is the selection. So uh, if an individual organism is not adapted to the fitness landscape, then selection appears. So, um, um, so, some, so the better adapted ones are retained for the next generation through procreation, while the rest are discarded or destroyed or they don't procreate. Um, so and uh, this way through each generation through a selection process the and, and through uh, the variability through mutations um, evolution happens uh, just like with the with the stones so uh, we if we if we uh, um, if you shake the screen then the uh, larger stones are retained so and uh, the, the, the sand or the smaller stones are selected. So they are removed from, from that generation and you continue on with the, with the larger stones. Of course, as I said, stones, uh, while they have variability, so I mean, you have stones of different sizes and uh, well, they kind of operate for their own individual advantages. So you have larger and, larger and smaller stones and you have a, have a, have a riddle and you select uh, those that, that fall through. Uh, of course, stones can't make copies of themselves. If they could, of course, you would end up with, with more and more larger stones the more you shake. Okay. And here, as I said, uh, selection works better with a diverse fitness landscape and variation. So um, uh, if, if there's not much difference between uh, between the individuals, if it's just like a petri dish full with nutrients and the bacteria just spread out, then uh, nothing really happens in terms of selection because every, no matter what mutations happen, every uh, individual bacteria can procreate. So the only selection process then would be if they can procreate at all. So if they, if they fulfill uh, the, this pre prerequisite and that's the only one that is then selected for. So just checking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hello. So. So uh, now we now we have uh, the theory of evolution with those three uh, uh, prerequisites, and we have uh, the different uh, processes that go around them. So mutations provide the variability. We have the fitness landscape that uh, allow systems to oper operate for their own individual advantage. Also, we have selection that allow uh, systems to operate for their own individual advantage. And as a, as a, of course, basic prerequisite, we have the system needs to be able to make copies of of itself. So that is uh, that is already evolution. And if you have that in any system, evolution appears. So uh, and that can be a Facebook post. A Facebook post can make copies of itself. Yes, there needs to be variability in the gene pool, for example, through mutations. Well, uh, maybe you copy some of it and uh, change the picture or there are other Facebook posts competing with your post. And systems need to be able to operate for their own individual advantage. Uh, of course, if someone likes your post, then he or she shares your post and not just a random other post. So uh, that itself is already evolution happening uh, in the in the social media sphere. That fulfills all the all the properties. Even though, of course, the system needs needs uh, you to make uh, to make the actual action of uh, of selection and of copying. Uh, this here evolution happens so uh, needs to be able to make copies of itself it can also use you to make copies of uh, itself so basically uh, facebook posts are a type of well basically type of virus if you if you if you want to interpret it like that okay so we have uh, we'll do a quick quick break and a quick uh, break for uh, qa um after after this one wait we are just checking ah, okay we have two two more then we do a quick break and then uh we can go into question and answers 
Um, selfish genes. So we have, we, we said, um, if, we, if we go back here, no. We have said, okay, there's the genotype and the phenotype. Um, the point is uh, the fitness landscape is only interested in the phenotype. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter what, what genes this one has. It only, uh, the only thing matters is uh, if in, in that form, the ape can, can survive in, in his environment. That is, that is the only point. Um, but, but behind that ape is of course a whole series of genes that build, uh, build that what we call the ape. So in here, the interesting thing is evolution doesn't only happen like on the, on the level of the ape. So it's not just, okay, uh, this ape uh, tries to make copies of, of, of himself or so and, and competes with other apes, but individual genes in the ape also follow follow this rule so the the individual gene wait, yeah the individual genes also try to outcompete other genes in the, in the ape but it's a little bit more complex one that is also uh, discussed i think more in the in the continuum book um we, a, a simple example would be and and something that l seems to be a little bit uh, bit, bit that it doesn't have to do anything with it, but let's say uh, an, an aunt, aunt or uncle uh, has has no children for him for him or herself. Um, is that is that someone who is uh, not very well adapted to the environment? Not necessarily. If that aunt or uncle cares for the children of their brother or sister, so because while the children are not that directly related to that uncle or aunt um, there are still genes in those children that are also in the aunt or uncle so that is the point uh, so it's not just uh, okay i have to make copies as many copies as possible of myself but for example also with uh, sexual reproduction you make also a compromise because you get only about half of your genes into uh, into your child and the other uh, half is from your uh, from your partner so hello Okay, so so uh, and as I say here, the advantages uh, have to benefit the individual organism or even the individual gene for evolution to work. So as I said, the example was uh, relatives. Uh, it's uh, enough to say. Um, Hey, I'm uh, I'm benefiting the my my uh, uh, brother or, or sister's children, so that is that is enough. The same goes naturally uh, goes of course for uh, for uh, let's say granddaughters or grandsons. So again, you don't just care about identical copies of yourself, but you care about your genes. So, hello. <laughs> So, we so you're setting up here. How are things? Uh, yeah, no problem. I'm I'm just finishing up here. Then we can go into question and others. So, uh, so um, and to to finish up my my earlier point about mutations not being the drivers of evolution. As I said, they provide the variability in the gene pool. Um, so it's more like you have a whole population changing um, um, or adapt, trying to adapt to the, so I just put you on mute but briefly. Um, uh, you have a whole uh, uh, population trying to adapt to the, to the environment. Um, and this is also reflected in the idea that there's no macro evolution. Um, so you don't, at least 
you don't just suddenly develop uh, develop uh, the uh, new, new wings or something like that. Uh, that is is very 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 rare that 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 larger changes happen in that regard, and that is usually a major major incidence, and that usually happen not through mutation but through a major change in the environment. For example, an, an impact of an of an asteroid. Um, and, and usually, if if you have if you have larger changes, or uh, then the cause is exaptation. So uh, you have one trait, and it is used for another thing. For example, feathers were usually, at least that's the theory, were, us were originally used for um, for providing heat insulation, and then were later repurposed for um, for jumping, or then later even for flying. Another example is uh, 3D cards. Originally, it was just a plaything for 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 gamers, and now it's a major major component of the Bitcoin industry. Uh, so no one 20 years ago could have thought, okay, we we will now use the the graphic cards for for games uh, and use it for uh, the economy. No one. Uh, and it looks like because if you if you look back, it looks like that it is designed that way. Yeah, some someone had. 1995 already the idea to develop step-by-step -step, uh, software and hardware to better calculate how, how to process bitcoins no uh, this repurposed and it looks like it was designed that way but it uh, but it isn't so we are already through here uh, i can unmute you if you have questions and I'll look into the chat. Yeah, I uh, just go through the comments. Uh, Facebook's algorithms are widely influencing the evolution of posts. Uh, yes, that is of course an interesting uh, uh, issue. I'll just. Uh, the question is what. What what is that Facebook algorithm in that regard? Mm, because it um, basically um, um, makes changes to the selection process, so um, it is part of the uh, fitness landscape. So it's it's as if uh, like you you're playing like a, a um, um, simulator. Uh, a godlike simulator where you simulate like uh, the um, wait uh, 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 ah, wrong button. Um, and uh, at some point like like a hand comes from 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 the sky and picks out uh, certain certain animals and re removes that animal from the from the gene pool so that is basically like the, the Facebook uh, algorithm that makes changes to the to the otherwise natural, well, influenced by the individuals, natural selection process. Um, so. Further questions? Otherwise, we can also go into the next topic, if you like. And that is the, but um, let's do, Brief, uh, do you need, no, I don't think you need a break. If you want a break, just write it. Otherwise, I would just say we just continue with the next point. We will, um, in the next meeting, in two weeks, we will also start with evolution of attention. Uh, but we can also give, I can also give you like a preview of what is uh, up next. Because that is already, we, we would already be going uh, deep into the question about consciousness, uh, because attention is a major component of that. Um, and again, our our little guy here with the with the big eyes. Um, so if I if I if I play a little bit, so uh, um, and if I interact with the with with the puppet. Uh, then your brain starts to think, okay, that puppet has some sort of consciousness. 
yes, you, you have some sort of consciousness. So I mean, you can you can do it, uh, of course, better than 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 I than than I do it. But that is basically the ventriloquist uh, effect. So you have like the the puppeteer, uh, and even though you abstractly perfectly know that the puppet is not talking, um, you uh, can say hey, or you, your brain interprets that as uh, there's uh, there's something happening it's some something strange is happening there that there, there's a person or something like a personality within that uh with, within that puppet and that is that is something that that your brain is doing automatically uh the question the big question is is consciousness just that i mean is it just us um um oh maybe i should share the picture uh is is consciousness just that that uh, we are looking at things and think that person thing computer or whatever is conscious or is it actually a property that we can test for um, because if you just i mean if i ask you now okay is that is that ape conscious or, or not i mean maybe you, your feeling is ah, okay maybe it looks it looks cute or something like that but is it really conscious and then your abstract mind says okay it's just a puppet so you are maybe conflicted in that regard and you don't really have an an answer to that and of course when when meeting a person uh, then maybe abstractly you say okay that person is also a human and i'm a human then that person uh, is consciousness and uh, i agree with my uh, my um my feeling or my 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 intuitive uh, feeling about whether or not that person has consciousness and that of course that question appears most prominently if you look at uh, apes because they are look they are looking quite similar to us and uh, they they move their eyes just like us so it seems like they are they're looking at certain things so uh, the question is why or, or what what points we need to say okay um hey that person is conscious so as i already mentioned the eyes um i think it is when, when we when we look uh, at someone and look look into that person's eyes um where they are looking at tells us a lot about that person i mean we already seem to know what they are thinking about I mean, when they're looking out the window, okay, we, we already know, okay, they think about something outside the window or just, just daydreaming. But still, uh, we assume that that is basically the door into someone's, uh, someone's consciousness. And one major um, concept in that regard is so-called attention. And that is a very important concept and that will accompany us throughout the, throughout the meetings. Um, because attention is not the same as awareness. Something can catch our eye without us really being conscious about. Uh, that is that is something we will discuss uh, once once we discuss awareness. Um, and attention, like if you, if you really just go through the, the to the to the basic definition, attention is the brain's uh, process of limiting alternative thought patterns then increasing the most dominant thought pattern strength. It is like a simple majority rule. The most successful thought pattern gets all the resources while other thought patterns are suppressed. While we can jump back and forth between different thoughts, we cannot have two dominant thought patterns at the same time. So as the, as the saying goes, something catches our attention. So something uh, goes into, into our mind and, and becomes the most, most dominant thought. Uh, even though we have like the subjective experience that we um, ex that we are aware of everything, but we aren't. We are we have that we have like focus on on individual things, and maybe uh, like a sh very very general description of the general room or whatever we are uh, we are in. Uh, but other than that, we have usually just one thing we are we are focusing on. But is that not? Can right. I can I just ask? I yes. Just, by the way, first Hello. of all, sorry, I got I got a um, two my my notifications came up and it was actually in uh, 
it wasn't Irish time, it was Dusseldorf time. So I'm in Dublin, so I'm very sorry. Oh, yeah. About Hello. Joining, joining a bit later. Oh, um, okay. Mm -hmm. they, they, just to go back for a little bit, I mean, they, mm -hmm. the, comparison, the comparison with the sock puppet, yeah. there's a very distinct, distinct difference. I mean, apart from the fact of not being able to focus on two things at the same time, which women can do, men, mm -hmm. men can't. <laughs> We've got months ago, I think. But the sock pop puppet, I was looking at it, the sock puppet is essentially your shirt with a smile on it. It's, it's the same thing, it's material. It's, 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 it's not, it's not, uh, it doesn't have a conscience. Yes. As we know. Yeah. It. Abstractly, yeah, we, we are fully aware that this is just a puppet. It's just, just a thing. Yeah. But our brain starts to build something when we're, when we're, when we're looking at, I mean, if I, if I just move it around and it looks like as if the ape is like observing the room, what's, what's going on. I mean, it's so we're, we're transferring what we know of something with a face. Yeah. And what we've learned as consciousness, we transfer it to an inanimate object. I mean, it is not, I mean, abstr our abstract knowledge of the puppet is, of course, is saying us, okay, uh, that is not a con conscious being. Yeah. But as we are, as we are looking at the, 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 the ape, like looking around, uh, uh, or, or watching me speak or something like that. Uh, if you do it a little bit better, maybe with uh, the, the tranquilitist voice, etc., uh, mm -hmm. then our brain starts to uh, at least have the, have the feeling, okay, something is going on there. And that is, of course, in conflict with our uh, abstract knowledge of what, what that is. And that is a little bit strange, strange occurrence. And that is why uh, tranquilitists uh, are like a popular popular show because people can't really deal with it like they have that feeling on the one side and they have the um have the abstract knowledge that this is a puppet yeah and that is usually challenged channeled into an mm -hmm. emotional release for example laughter or something like that uh, because it creates some sort of tension and that tension requires uh, release and that is basically the whole uh, Whole, whole idea of the of the performance then of a, of a tranquilist tranquilist okay I have to I have to do that <laughs> um, so uh, so what I'm not saying that okay just by looking around or so something is conscious I'm saying that uh, we have like we get like a feeling that something is going on there that is and the question because, hmm? because it's not it doesn't have it doesn't have any automatic ability yes yeah. It, it can only function if you're doing it for it. Yeah. The question so, is, so it's, yeah. if you're if you're giving it the sense of life as such, that's your head, that's your imagination doing it. So it's your imagination, not not, and your interpretation is something that's not real. Yeah. Well, the question is, what do we have to add, and where, where is like the the limit? I mean, when when where where's the where's the line where we say, okay, that is really then a conscious being. Uh, and here it isn't. So that is that is. I mean, that is the big philosophic question we have to have to answer. And I mean, on the on the very end, on on the side is uh, we have something that we absolutely know for sure that thing is not conscious. But we have like the first first feeling or something is going on. It, it behaves a little bit like like uh, like a living being. If I just move it around. True, true. I so it's like the art, really. It's 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 it's, uh, it's 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 embedding humanity into art because yeah. it's reflecting us. It's re reflecting reality. It's not. Re it isn't reality, but it's reflecting reality. Yeah, and we we, we project, of course, something something on it. I mean, uh, it is like uh, the the computer isn't working, and we curse at it. I mean, we abstractly we are we absolutely sure that that curse will not fix the problem. I mean, yeah. we are, everyone says that is absolutely true, but still we uh, act like the computer is a person. So we, we project some sort of personhood into things and we do it very easily with some things, I mean, or a car or something like that, that doesn't even have like cute eyes or something like that. Uh, and uh, if, he, if he like add, like computer components to it, like that maybe automatically moves around or follows my, my finger or something like that. Uh, maybe 
it becomes more and more a feeling like uh, maybe it is conscious and where where is the limit so that is that's called paranoia yeah. <laughs> psychosis <laughs> or or that yeah that's a, a little bit i mean we are i mean the point is um to detect conscious beings in our environment is such an important social social uh, ability that we absolutely need that i mean it is a huge difference between uh, like a pile of pile of sticks and a person a person we have social uh, interactions we have social relationships it's important for our status uh, money and etc and a pile of sticks is just an inanimate object and uh, to detect very quickly if that is, is a conscious being is very a very important ability we need to have in our social interaction yeah that is that one of the the primary qualifications as well for computer logic as well so when what's the asimov has the uh when a computer system doesn't want to die can actively decide not to die that's just that's displaying humanistic behavior because it's, it's got a fear of death Mm. Well, that is then also uh, like a self-worth and a projection in the future, a self-empathy, like uh, I want I want my future self to live, etc. So that's, th th those are all then, then advanced concepts. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. But that is, yeah, but that, that, I mean, that's, that is, that is really, that those are really the core questions to, and to arrive there, we really have to, I mean, there are a lot of steps to 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 get to to explain that. That's that's why it's uh, uh, a longer course. So we won't get there today, but uh, in the course of the meetings, we will get there. That's that's my promise. So if you stay for fifty meetings, then <laughs> I think around we will take around uh, ten meetings or so, and then we get there. Excellent. I hope, to, I hope to join at the right time. Yeah, this, the, yeah <laughs> I have to. I mean, everything is also recorded on, on YouTube, so you can, uh, can, can, can see it later. Perfect. So, okay, then I'll just continue. Oh, yeah, I already have it here. Okay, uh, coming back to attention. So attention is something that uh, our brain basically allocates um, resources to. So that is, that is the main point. Uh, it is also basically a way of optimizing. I mean, it is also like a side effect of the of the whole thing. I mean, um, the brain isn't always lighting up completely. Um, instead, uh, the uh, oh. right. uh, instead the um, um, certain certain parts of our brain are uh, allocated uh, basically sugar and, and oxygen so that way uh, the brain doesn't need that much resources otherwise we would need a lot more uh, i think it's uh, 20 20 watts or something like that our brain just needs that's that's all um so we will come back to that uh, uh, concept again and again. So that is just a central concept. So we will, I will bring up that definition again uh, at a later point. So let's continue here. Um, so uh, the question is now, how does the brain manage to uh, man manage attention? I mean, that is, that is the, how, how does the brain manage to focus uh, certain resources on uh, on, on, on certain brain parts. And for that, we really have to go, we really have to take our guy again here. Poor, poor guy. I knew him well. No. Um, and open, open up a little bit. And we really have to, uh, oh, my phone break. And you really have to uh, look at all the brain parts, and it's not just uh, like these these two main 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 parts, and that's it. Uh, there's a lot more behind it. It's pretty falling apart. So, so here we have it, um, and we basically have to know which what what each part does 
And it's not just, uh, I mean, it's the, it's the common perception, okay, there's like the, the thinking part here the, uh, at the top and then there are some other parts, uh, but that's it. Uh, each part here has a very specific, actually a very specific function. And at the end of the, at the, end of the course, you will know which, uh, which part has uh, which function. Um, at the very, very basic uh, structure, um, wait, um, here at the very end, that's, that's the uh, back of your head, uh, that's where the uh, visual cortex lies, the so-called uh, occipital lobe. And the information, the visual information that arrive here are then processed in the brain uh, along a stream of information. So basically the, the information that, that uh, arrives here is then processed in a, in a stream that goes up here. Um, and the, that, that's one stream and another stream goes, goes uh, on the side. And uh, the stream on the side is a little bit quicker it deals with the information, uh, what are you seeing? Because it's more important to know um, that there's a tiger somewhere uh, than to know where exactly that is. And here uh, in, the, in the upper part is uh, a process, processing where things are. So that, that part alone basically is all about uh, seeing and in, also like combination with hearing because the ears coming here, right? Uh, are a combination of seeing and hearing. So that is already all taken up uh, by, by, by basic uh, signal processing. And here in the middle, it is combined with uh, uh, sensory information like a uh, sense of touch. And then the front part here is a motor, motor uh, uh, calculation, like how, how you, you can move your, move your arm, move your fingers. And at the front part, that is just a, just a little bit the frontal part that is basically uh, strategic thinking, thinking about the future, uh, modeling, expecting what the other person will do, what society expects from you and your model of yourself. Okay. Um, so that is, that is you, you see already, it's not just like a, a whole thinking thing or that's all abstract thought. That is a lot of signal processing goes here on. And if we, if we open up a little bit, and we, we will go into more detail later, it just give, give you a general overview. Um, there's also a whole uh, part here below that's also signal transferring and communication between the hemispheres that will be a will be an important topic, uh, this part here. And uh, uh, here at the, at, the, at the end, additional um, motor functions and uh, function that, that uh, can be replayed. And here at the very center, take more. That is then basically, yeah. <laughs> The, the, all, all the rest, like uh, hormones, uh, fight and flight, uh, behavior, freeze behavior, uh, then the whole uh, control of your uh, body temperature, um, of your blood flow, sleeping, uh, all, all the, all the basic, uh, basic functionality. And of course, uh, motor, motor functions. I mean, here it goes then down to the, to the, down to the spine. Here, a lot of uh, motor and, and sensory information go up and down. Also, um, where they hold the connection to the your hormonal system. So it's all, all, all in this, this little basic part. So uh, you can do a lot of with, with this one, but you can't do a lot of uh, signal processing and uh, playing chess with, with, with this one. So that is, that is the basic Just the basic, uh, we will come to that back again uh, uh, a number of times. So, and I have to. Okay, so what, what did we have here? Uh, just just some, some, uh, some terms for you to understand. Uh, we have uh, a lobe 
a lobe is basically a, a anatomical division uh, where you say okay that is the that is the frontal lobe that is the parietal lobe that is the uh, occipital lobe etc so we have have certain 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 parts of the brain uh, you have the hemispheres the two to left and left and right uh, brain side uh, then you have the allocortex um, that is the uh, that is basically everything that well that's a little bit more complicated that's everything that isn't isn't this part but also isn't uh, part of the no okay it's a little bit part part of the neocortex uh, for example the olfactory system and the hippocampus I think the hippocampus is somewhere here it's it's not one hundred percent divided into the different parts, but I will also show you later um, uh, pictures about that. So in the in the neocortex, it's basically uh, all the uh, signal processing that I talked uh, before, and also the frontal lobe of the goal directed behavior. Um, going on here. Then we have the cerebrum, uh, that is the uh, that is basically uh, the, the whole uh, neocortex plus oh, something is missing here. Uh, oh, okay, the whole neocortex plus the olfactory system, like a uh, sense of smell, uh, and the allocortex, that is the hippocampus, basal ganglia, and well, the as I said, the olfactory bulb. We will discuss all those individual parts later, but those are all important parts. And then we have the cerebral cortex. The so cortex uh, is the outer layer. Uh, so that is basically where the processing goes, is going on. And um, from, the, from the, here you see like, uh, if you look closely, uh, the, the outer layer basically, and you have a lot of connections going on between the part. So uh, connecting individual parts is a huge part of the brain. Then you have, uh, well, some, some, other, some, uh, some other things, uh, gyros, Gyros like the, like the food. <laughs> um, uh, that's like a fold or ridge, like something like that. And a sulcus is like a groove, like going between those. And another point that will come up again, uh, sense data, just for the, for the definition to be clear, that is uh, information uh, converted to a form usable by cognition. Uh, I mean, we will, the definition is not 100% does, well, we will come back to that again and again. It really, we really have to uh, work on that definition sense data because uh, that is close to like um, um, conscious experience, and that is a little bit uh, difficult. Uh, but we will get get to to a clearer definition of sense data. Okay, and yeah, now uh, how did how did that all come to be? I mean, uh, it already looks a little bit like uh, mixed together out of different different things. It look, doesn't look like someone sat there and, and constructed it. Ah, okay. Uh, quick question. Is the limb region part of the brain, the limb region part of the brain, hippocampus or neocortex? The limb region part, do you mean the uh, motor functions. Okay, it takes a moment. Um, okay, so uh, if you, I'll, I'll answer them then once I'm through here. Um, so you already see uh, it consists of a lot of different different things, and it's not really that structured. It has this folded and and one over the other it's something something must have happened and for that we need we need we need uh, evolution to to explain what what has happened so basically uh, uh, basically we need to uh, explain every part of it uh, with a specific evolutionary purpose uh, and we have we have to explain every step of the way of evolution I mean, we can't just wait for a certain part of the brain to develop before it is useful, but each single part of the brain has to be useful for the next generation. So we can't 
that there's no architecture plan, architectural plan behind the brain. Each change had to uh, benefit the next generation. That is that is uh, the important part we have to take with from the from the first part from today from the discussion of evolution. Um, and for that, we really have to explain every single part. Uh, limbic system, we will get to it shortly. Uh, I think uh, the hypothalamus connected with the amygdala. And the amygdala is connected to uh, the neocortex. It was a question in the, the chat. Okay, moving on. So, and we can actually draw a, I put that to the large here. Uh, ah, okay, now I'm in, I'm in the way. Well, I hope you can read that. Okay, um, so when we can actually, yeah, it's a little bit, it's a little bit small here. So I just, okay. We can actually um, put all those parts in, I mean, there's a second page, um, all those parts in a timeline and build in that regard our brain uh, on, uh, on an evolutionary timeline. Mm, and it started around 600 million years ago with sponges. Uh, do I have a picture? Why do I have to check it? Ah. Uh, yeah, okay, I will, I will go into detail uh, of each uh, entry, so I don't talk too much about each entry. Um, and we will come back to it uh, at the end. So it started with uh, sponges with calcium signaling. I will explain it. Uh, then uh, hydras uh, with a basic nerve net, then the first arthropods that do a basic classification of information. Then we have an uh, olfactory system, a sense of smell as a first real uh, sense. And then with the fishes, uh, I mean with the fish, there's a lot of new parts developed. Then it's the optic tectum, uh, like the control of the eyes, the thalamus, uh, the integration of uh, different information like uh, um, what you hear and what, what you see or uh, the connection of the uh, both eyes information into into an integrated information. You have the uh, basal ganglia to resolve conflict. So if you have a signal coming from the right and a signal coming from the left, you have to decide which signal to use. And you can't just move one, half of your body in the one direction and half of your body in the other direction because then you get neither uh, neither prey. So you have to have some sort of prioritization going on. And the amygdala to uh, evalu evaluate information. So which is really better or which is, which is worse. So basically what is good, what is bad. And the hippocampus uh, to orientate yourself in the, uh, in the world. So basically uh, a map uh, and basically connecting to memories with each other. Also, that's something we will talk. And then 450 years, uh, 450 million years ago with the sharks, we have uh, cerebellum uh, that is uh, like optimized movement programs to better uh, hunt prey. And with the reptilians, we have a wolst that is similar to the neocortex in mammals that is higher level processing, meaning um, you don't just react to your environment, but you can basically make a plan. And well, 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 okay, but that comes a little bit later. Uh, but high level processing also like, uh, as I told, like uh, information processing, analysis, uh, categorization, all that, all that part. And then f uh, 55 million years ago with the primates, uh, prefrontal cortex and planning. Um, important to note is this is just one, I just make it small again. Uh, that is just, oops, no. Uh, no, I broke it. Ah, okay. I know what I did. Um, 
So this is just uh, one one pathway through the through the whole thing. So there are of course other uh, other animals with similar with similar properties. Like uh, uh, insects have have their own type of brain and uh, dolphins, spiders, and there are, there are other types of um, of animals that have similar structures. So it's just like uh, um, uh, going back from the primates and going going to the sponges. Um, so uh, it isn't like a, a linear progression from the from from one type of of animal to to humans or something like that. So there are different different parts, of course. Uh, so I would say let's let's look at let's look at one. Let's look at the sponges. Sponges. So those are sponges. Um, so they use a form of. Um, calcium signaling it's called um, I mean they are basically just sitting there on the on the on the floor and they are basically filtering water and taking out nutrients so that is basically all they're doing um, but they do have from time to time to uh, push out polluted water so uh, there, there could be some 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 polluted water in there and they have to push it out and pushing something out requires a organization i mean you can't just i mean the, the the sponge can't just okay now i push out the thing and then it's good but you have to have some sort of organization going on to do that and uh, the sponge doesn't have nerve cells uh, i mean doesn't have nerves doesn't have a brain it has nothing but it can uh, signal uh, between individual cells uh, and that is called calcium signaling so basically uh, you have uh, a number of cells uh, uh, signaling the neighboring cells uh, by pushing calcium in those, in those neighboring cells. And those neighboring cells are already filled up to the brink with calcium and they overflow and they also push out their calcium to the next. So it's like a, a chain reaction then. So a group of cells uh, push out their calcium and to the, to, the, to the other cells and they push out and that's like a chain reaction to the whole uh, through the whole animal so again that is an animal that you see here um, and this way uh, the uh, sponge can uh, do a concerted action namely pushing out water so you can imagine like uh, no what is here going out ah, okay that's can't see that uh, that that's like maybe starting at the bottom and then uh, it 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 uh, contracts and then then it goes up 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 and then pushes out the pushes out the water in one in one go and then of course after that action was was uh, executed and then all the calcium was uh, was was pushed out into other cells then the the cells have to of course replenish their the calcium uh, again for the next action so they are there basically eating an uh, uh, a snack again and uh, once they're filled again they, they can can do it again you also see it i mean it's a different different process but it's similar similar principle in those uh, venus fly traps that have to uh, fill up their um uh, I, i'm not sure if they use calcium signal they, they also use a similar type of signal because they also don't have a brain but the point is you don't need a brain oh i mean <laughs> If, if, if that's all you need to do to push out polluted water, then you don't need a brain, but still can do things. Uh, but let's look at a more interesting one. Uh, and that is called the Hydra. Just checking if the picture, yeah, okay. That is called the Hydra. And uh, the Hydra uh, sticks on, 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 on the ground. Uh, it has like a little, little, little foot i mean it can move around but i mean slowly uh, but usually it sticks just just around and and it flays, flails around its tentacles and when there's a signal in the tentacle i mean if if something touched uh, the tentacle then uh, it can like retract the the tentacle and then eat usually like single cell um, how's it called uh, the daphnia the, the small water 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 animals i mean that's single cell organisms and then they eat it so you I mean that's not that's not a huge uh, huge animal i think that's a few millimeters uh, in size 
and uh, what they are doing is basically they have like a nerf net but they a nerf net means uh, there's no central processing meaning all you can do is uh, there is a signal meaning okay contract that's all so if you had a nerf net then when someone touches you then all your muscles would would contract i mean maybe you catch then someone or something like that but you wouldn't know or wouldn't have the information okay uh, i was touched at a, at a at a at the arm or the head or something like that and you could also not say okay uh, if i was touched on the arm then move the other arm or something like that so you only have the option uh, i was touched somewhere and then the only action i have is to contract everything i mean i think those are at least uh, a little bit uh, independent, the, the individual arms, so at least the uh, it would only be one arm that would contract, but it's still the whole arm. So there are, there are now options to to contract a part of it or do certain actions with the, with the arm because of that nerve net. So all the signals are equal and all the actions are equal. So that is, that is uh, uh, basically an end-to-end -end connection. So... Again, if you have questions, just write or... Um, okay, uh, there are some, some other parts in, on, the, on the animal that don't, uh, are, are not relevant, uh, but, the, but really core point, nerve net, any signal leads to all actions or just one action. I mean, not a specific action, but you can, you only have one action. So, uh, so the next one in, in, in the predecessors of arthropods, um, they introduced a signal processing because we already saw, okay, the nerve net just has a one-to-one -one connection. Um, so whatever happens, if anything happens, then do the one action I have. And with uh, classif classification of signals, we can have a more diverse uh, action and diverse uh, um, uh, processing. And one example for uh, that classification is the XOR filter. XOR filter basically means um, if uh, something changed, then do an action. That is, that is, the, that is the basic, uh, basic ex explanation. For example, if you have an image, uh, or if you have two images and you do an XOR filter on both images, then you see all the parts that have changed from one picture to the other. And of course, that is most interesting for our signal processing, because if you think uh, you have a visual signal and you want to, of course, to focus on the things that changed. Uh, for example, if something moved, then you want to focus your attention on that. And a simple classification of signals, I mean, that can be done by uh, combining the, the nerve cells in a certain way. Um, you can have like on, on the biological level an, an XOR filter and this way you can actually uh, focus on changes in a picture. So, yeah, okay, here is there. Oops. And no, so. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, if you, and, and another application is of course to find the uh, contours and the edge detection of a uh, of an image so uh, from uh, here something change i mean okay you don't see the mouse um on the on the edges of the palm something changed from white to black and then nothing changes i mean it's black 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 and then again from black to white and on the right side, you see basically the result of this filter. So the filter shows everything uh, where something changed between uh, two neighboring pixels or two neighboring places. And of course, uh, the right picture is easier to deal with than the left picture because the right picture contains fewer information. I mean, it's just focused on okay, what is the what is the contour of the of the animal of the of the thing you're looking at. Uh, I mean, basically what is changing between different parts of the image. And you can also then, then uh, yeah, as I said, uh, recognize movement. 
Okay. Then moving on. Uh, this guy, uh, Lancelot. 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 Uh, there are like very primitive fish. Uh, they have. Uh, um, they have, uh, for example, those uh, gill slits for um, uh, that is used in um, uh, in fish for oxygen, but they don't use it for oxygen. I think they use it for for navigation, and uh, they don't really have, as you see, a. Uh, heart or something like that. So they take in uh, oxygen directly through the skin. And they also don't have a brain, but they do have a nerve cord and they do have um, a way of um, um, smelling. So they have like a, a primitive uh, um, uh, sense of smell and uh, those uh, smell cells or olfactory smells are distributed around the around the body so this way uh, the uh, lancelet can move around in the water and follow a certain um, uh, certain nu nutrients and, and swim towards nu nutrients uh, yeah and that's the olfactory system and uh, given that uh, biological systems are uh, yeah biochemical systems uh, the most obvious uh, sense uh, such an organism has is um, simply de the detection of molecules in the in the environment and that is also directly connected with um, um, the the intake of nutrients so it's a very basic and fundamental sense and yeah here i, I wrote that uh, using using several olfactory receptors along their flanks lancelets can navigate so they actually navigate with smell so what it is so it smells like smells like uh, that to the left, and I go to the left. So that's 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 the way they they navigate. Uh, in 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 modern times, we say okay, yeah, well, a sense of smell is isn't that important, but actually, it still has a lot of a lot of important info, uh, uh, functions in us. That is uh, mate selection, M -H M H C. Uh, so that is that plays a, an important part. So. With the olfactory system, we can detect if someone is genetically com uh, compatible, actually. I mean, not too close to us and not too far from us genetically. Uh, same with, uh, we use it to, uh, for, for example, for the gag reflex. And if we, if we smell something strong, then uh, we assume it is poison and then we have the gag reflex. Um, it is also directly connected with our neocortex. Um, that is uh, something we will come back to later. Uh, even the neocortex can affect how we smell things. So um, if you imagine uh, when you, you, you can basically focus your smell, if you know what, what, what you are sniffing for, basically you can prime the olfactory cells in your, um, in your olfactory system. Uh, I think I will have a picture later and uh, optimize uh, optimize it so it uh, can smell better actually and we will come back to that also uh, that is basically a top-down control because you have some abstract knowledge like I'm uh, do I smell something burnt with that abstract idea your brain uh, reconfigures your olfactory cells and focuses them on anything that smells like burnt and then again you can actually smell better and we will also see that this same principle will be applied to our sense of sight too so if you if you're looking for something uh, if you know you're, you're looking for something then your uh, visual system is reconfigured so that it uh, has better shot chances to see it so it's not just a one way, like, OK, all the information come in, come in, come in, come in, and then it is processed in the brain and that's it. But it's really a, a, a bottom up. I mean, the information come in uh, from, from the nose to the, to the brain, but also a top down system it, um, where, where it recalibrates uh, depending on the context information.
So if you know the context information, it is easier to find something. The same is, uh, of course, with your uh, uh, sense of hearing. If you know what you're, what you're, what you're hearing for, um, then it is easier to, to listen to that. Uh, here, even more complex processing is required. We will we come to that, that uh, later with the telemos, uh, because let's say you're in a big room and there are many different people. And then by knowing, I mean, by actually looking at someone that, that is talking, you can hone into that conversation. So using your visual information about the location of the person to improve your uh, auditory sense. So that is, uh, that is a lot of processing going on. Um, and uh, uh, where, we see, where we see when this doesn't work is in our Zoom conferences with more than three people because you don't have then uh, a location of that person. You have all that um, um, noise or all that uh, speech coming from one loudspeaker and as, as mono and you're, you're losing a lot of that capability you usually use using in a, in a room full of people. So, and that, uh, I mean, the, the Lancet, I don't think it can do priming uh, like that, but with our neocortex, we can do that. Uh, so the point is here just, Lancelet has an olfactory system and this was one of the first. Uh, ah, here, yeah. And that's, okay, that's a little bit. Um, that is basically our modern uh, architecture. It is a lot more complicated, a lot of more uh, parts. Um, uh, I mean, that is, that is basically a simplified one. At the top of the, uh, I mean, the, the nose, then it comes uh, to the olfactory bulb. I mean, the, the particles of the air go into the mu mucus and then connect to uh, sensory cells. That is the olfactory bulb. And the olfactory bulb is uh, connected to the uh, trigeminal geminal nerve. That is the face, if, uh, face ner uh, nerve. And it can actually cause like... Uh, when you when you bite into a, a lemon or something like that, you make that lemon face, and that is actually because there's a direct connection between those, uh, and that is kind of universal between. I mean, for example, mammals, whenever they they bite into a lemon, they make the same uh, uh, olfactory bulb trigeminal nerve face. Um, because there's a direct connection between that. There's also like a communication to other members of your, your species don't eat that because you're making that face. Um, then it is uh, connected to the hypothalamus. We will also deal with that uh, later. Uh, I mean, the whole um, thing about the um, uh, yeah, limbic system, exactly. The neocortex, we already talked with that top down, <coughs> top down and bottom up. And the amygdala. Uh, that uh, is also connected. Amygdala will be an important point. Amygdala is basically uh, takes takes all the sensory information in and evaluates it, and the hippocampus for memory. Um, and because of those direct connections, it's also um, and also direct connection to the neocortex. Uh, like if we if we go to a place and remember a certain smell, then we immediately have can can recall that memory and it is even uh, people in a coma uh, usually people are in a coma when the thalamus is uh, damaged meaning um, the thalamus is required for especially processing of auditory and, uh, and visual information uh, they, they fall into a coma but uh, their olfactory bulb is still connected to the neocortex so they can still make smell memories actually. So they're still conscious concerning smell. That is also interesting. And that is also an important point we will later need to better define what is consciousness. So again, if you, if you look, if you understand those, those the, the, the architecture that is behind it, you can understand or explain a lot of uh, daily de de things that, that uh, happen to us on a, on a daily basis and also possibly things about consciousness. So I'm just checking here. Um, checking messages. Okay, all good. Um, yeah, 
again, if you have any questions, just type in and it will be answered. So, next one. Ah, yeah. So, uh, again, uh, we will we'll go into all these uh, uh, later. Next one is the fish already, the optic tectum. And that is basically uh, something close, relatively close to the eyes for, for us. I mean, uh, no, I need, oh, I need this guy. Uh, no, okay, but I need more space. So we have this guy, and you see, I mean, that is all for the for the uh, that's the eye socket, and you see here these two right? yeah these two openings uh that those are the openings for the um, visual nerve and when they are connected i mean here around here is the optic tectum and that is basically the first place where the where the information of both eyes connect and here are basic information uh, basic processing like um, tracking objects uh, like tracking objects or uh, blinking I mean it's basically a protection of your of your eyes so you want it uh, as the processing as close uh, to the eyes as possible as well as uh, also head turning reflexes so for protection or for focusing your attention and if you put put in an optic tectum in in, in this guy <laughs> then uh, I mean what what will happen the it will be able to track objects and uh, blinking and uh, head turning reflexes. So if, if something comes here, then he will will turn turn his head. Yeah. So that is the that, that is the basic thing. And then we then that's that's what I uh, talked uh, uh, earlier. Uh, when when we put in that and not just like like with with my hand or something like that, then it's already eerily looking like a life form that has attention. I mean it 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 manages its resources. I mean it's it moves its uh, its body. Uh, the question is how far is consciousness from from attention? So that is that will be the big question, big open question. We still have to address. Uh, continuing. Ah, okay, okay. Actually, I needed that picture, but now I have it. Um, zip. I'll put that larger. So here you see uh, the whole thing from the top, as I uh, shown you before, uh, with the left and right eye in the in in the middle, the optic. Uh, Chasm, that's uh, where, where all those reflexes are, um, eye blinking, head turning, etc. And, uh, oh, well, no, uh, okay. The optic chasm, okay, I was a little bit. Uh, the optic chasm is just where the, uh, where the uh, visual nerves connect, and a little bit behind is the uh, superior colliculus or, or optic tectum. Depends if it's mammals or, or non mammals. Um, where the processing goes on uh, concerning head turning, etc. So it's right there, right there in the middle. And you also see uh, the, the yellow part at the bottom, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. So that's also where the connect, uh, where the information from both eyes is combined in the thalamus. We will look at that later. Also interesting, the visual cortex is at the very end. Uh, one could ask the question why. Not sure if, if someone wants to ask the question why. Uh, otherwise, I ask the question why. Um, one could could ask that. I mean, why is it at the very end? Shouldn't the visual cortex be at the very front? Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, we have all those other parts of the brain that do all the important uh, time critical processing, like head turning. Like closing closing your eyelids, uh, pupil reactions, etc. Those are all processed relatively quickly, and everything else is then uh, processed uh, at the at the very uh, end of the of the brain in the visual cortex. Also, 
uh, along the way from the from the thalamus to the visual cortex there's also some processing going on so it is more like a um, um, uh, oh, what's the English word? Please bunt. Um, like how they they produce cars on a long long stretch, and at at each part of the of the journey from the eyes to the visual cortex, uh, something something is something processing is with concerning processing going on, and information is also uh, forwarded to the rest of the brain. So there's a lot of already going on before it even reaches the visual cortex. So, and I switch again. Again, questions. Okay, so, and we talked about the thalamus. Thalamus, just checking the time. Um, Time-wise, I will finish up with this chapter of the different brain parts. We are halfway through, so I think another half an hour we will, we will need. Ah, conveyor belt, yeah, thanks. Conveyor belt was there. So along along the path from the from the uh, uh, from 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 the eyes uh, down to the to the to the to the visual cortex, a lot of is happening, and the information is dis already distributed to certain parts of the of the brain. Uh, so that uh, the image is actually a little bit. Uh, uh, misleading because there's always a few connections going left and right as you, you find it uh, a lot in the brain there's like 10 percent of of information going then there and five percent a little bit there etc so there's a lot of little optimizations going on this is not a clean architecture where all the information goes first to our visual cortex and then to our parietal cortex uh, parietal lobe etc 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 but it's it's a little bit a mixed mixed thing so whenever something uh, is optimized there's always some some uh, something going on it's not it's not a clean architecture but it's an efficient archi architecture okay so and now we look at the thalamus um, that is the central part where uh, there are actually two uh, can you see oh you you should be able to see my cursor actually. Um, here, can you see it? Yeah. Uh, actually, um, oh, I have to click. Okay. Um, there, there's one uh, thalamus on the on the left left hemisphere and one on the right hemisphere. Um, it's a little bit uh, tedious to, uh, to do to uh, explain the whole split here between the left and right eye. Um, the basic idea is you want to have all the information from both eyes on. Um, I mean, you, you don't want just the left eye on the left side and the right eye on the right side, but you want to actually uh, want to have the left visual field on one side and the right visual field on the other side. So you're basically combining the, uh, as you see here, the uh, here the, the left part of the retina, here the left part of the retina is combined into into one one in part information and here the same with the right and the right. So that is, that is basically the idea. We will come at a later meeting uh, about that, what happens if there are problems with this because the visual part is, is very important for our, um, uh, of course, for our conscious processing. And uh, depending on where some damage is, we experience it very differently. So that is also like a, a way of investigating consciousness. Okay, the thalamus, thalamus, thalamus. Um, so the, the basic basic idea of thalamus is an integration of information uh, from different parts of the brain, for example, um, visual sense and auditory sense, uh, or for example, uh, different colors, because we have uh, different um, color cones in, in the retina and they have to, uh, have to be combined into a, a, a color. That, is, that will also be an important part, talking about color. You might have heard the philosophical um, aspect of it. 
um, uh, what is the uh, I mean what is the what is the experience of experiencing the color red and that is happening in the in the thalamus so the is it on the next uh, no okay the eye has different uh, different cones red green and blue basically and those three different information channels have to be combined at some place i mean if you, if you look at things we don't see like little dots of red green and blue depending on the on the color we, we see actually colors so if you look at uh, purple we don't see red and blue um, dots somewhere we see the color purple and that is uh, actually a pre-processing going on in the thalamus before it even reaches the visual cortex so uh, as a, as a uh, point point of thought um, um, it is uh, what what we are seeing is not real i mean what we are seeing is not real in in terms of uh, it's already pre-processed when we look at colors there's already something pre-processed going on we don't see exactly what our eyes perceive i mean we don't see what uh, our red green and blue uh, um, um uh, or red red uh, green and blue uh, cones of the of the retina perceive uh, we perceive already a pre-processed information about the color because it, it never even arrives differently in, in the visual cortex it's, it's already uh, changed before it even uh, arrived in the in the visual cortex so in here especially it's so called the lgn um, that uh, that does the that does the combination of the of the colors okay and we will also revisit the thalamus uh, uh, whole oftentimes later because it also uh, as i mentioned earlier combines the auditory and visual information so now we have a lot of uh, information sens sensory information going on um, the problem is now we have conflicting information. Uh, we have uh, a shark from the left and a shark from the right. What should we do? Should we just do nothing because there are, there are conflicting information or should we as fast as possible swim forward as a fish? Uh, for this, we need the basal ganglia uh, to, um, uh, to arbitrate uh, the decision or, or the, the signals. Uh, here wrote a uh, neural committees. I will uh, get into this uh, later. That is, will be an important part uh, when talking about creativity. The point is, you have different parts of the brain competing with each other. Uh, signal from the left, signal from the right. In which direction should you go? Um, that is uh, then decided or ultimately arbitrated by the basal ganglia. So there's not like an, an, a CEO sitting in the basal ganglia looking at the different options and then, then thinking about what to do, but it arbitrates the different signals and says, okay, let's go with the strongest signal, for example, uh, or let's swim away from the strongest signal and ignore the weakest sing signal completely instead of like doing nothing or, or trying to do both. You know, so it's it's like an it's like a referee and provides rules and structure. Um, another part, the amygdala, uh, that is also crucial. Um, just just saying, okay, strongest signal or so is maybe not 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 enough. I mean, just swimming away from the biggest shark. I mean, it's a it's a viable strategy, but maybe you want to add more to it. Uh, for example, you want to give value, for example, if you, if you see a food source, uh, you want to uh, give, give value to it, positive value, and then um, compare it with other things in your environment, for example, dangers, and then decide, okay, should you, should you pursue that food item, uh, even though there is, there's, there's danger nearby. And the amygdala basically takes in sense data and uh, based on experience actually and that, that's the first uh, first organ that can actually learn uh, based on that experience uh, you had in the past uh, you can uh, then determine which uh, which way to go um, and given given its function in terms of evaluation it is also connected 
um, uh, with the homolysis, hormonal system, I mean limbic system, uh, with the uh, hypothalamus, um, because if it sees a danger, if, if, if it um, recognizes sense data that looks like danger, a dangerous animal, so it can activate that and directly then initiate a fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. Uh, we will also deal with that uh, later. And then, then for example, um, put all the resources in, in swimming away. And it also provides a basic form of memory um, because sure you see the, the you see the shark now but if you turn turn away and try to swim away in that moment you no longer see the shark and should you stop swimming away i mean should you stop having fear no the you still have the the, um, the hormones in in your system and you're still uh, you're still afraid and these uh, the, these hormones in your in your blood are basically a form of memory until they are uh, degraded or or recycled by the by the by the organism. Um, that is a very very basic form of memory. Yeah, and again, it can learn basic associations between sense data and emotions. So if it finds something good to eat, then there's a positive positive feedback, uh, vice versa with uh, with with danger. Okay, so hippocampus. Uh, hippocampus is uh, basically also a form of memory but more of mapping so you have two sense data or two experiences for example uh, an opening with trees and uh, a berry bush so um, and you know that when you walk to the uh, opening with the trees and uh, you get near the berry bush so what, what you can do with the hippocampus is to combine those two experiences, meaning you can you can basically create a, a map like you go like like you you're navigating through the city, you go through place A, place B, place C, and they are connected with each other. And the hippocampus basically connects those different experiences um, into, uh, into into a map, into a connected map, and uh, provides these these connections. So if you if you if you are in a certain place, the hippocampus allows you to know, okay, what are the connected places around. So that's, that is then also used for, for navigation. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, it can also, uh, for example, um, it can help you to remember, okay, where, where, can, you any, where can you do, uh, where can you forage uh, berry trees or other fruits or or grass or something like that. What what is the what is their current state? Uh, that is all in the in the hippocampus. So the the function is very basic. Okay, it, it can connect to it can make temporal relationships between uh, experiences. But in result, it's very power. It is very powerful because you can have then a mental map of your environment. Onwards to the cerebellum. Cerebellum, uh, already mentioned in uh, sharks, uh, to optimize your, I mean, it's also, of course, in mammals, but it's mo most prominent uh, also in sharks. The cerebellum, cerebellum, cerebellum um, basically provides you uh, with, with uh, the calculation power uh, to combine different motor programs. So it's similar, actually, to the um, uh, hippocampus. Hippocampus com uh, combines um, sense data or experiences and the cere cerebellum combines uh, motor actions uh, so that you don't have to make one action then use your sense data to calculate the next action and then decide for the next etc but you can like have a quick uh, swim left swim right swim down swim up and then, then grab or something like that um, and if you have a better motor program in your cerebellum than your prey then as a shark you're more successful um, it also acts like as a secondary brain, basically, uh, and it can automat uh, automatically perform certain, certain, certain actions. For example, driving a bicycle with the cerebellum is much easier because it, um, uh, you just have to execute the same motor program again and again and not think each, each time how to push the pedal down in, in, in each second. And 
Um, it is also used for balance because this is basically also a motor program, uh, how, to, how to balance your body and also language fluency and social behavior. That's, we'll also go into that later. Uh, language fluency because I mean a lot of uh, muscle move movements of course are done when speaking. Neocortex and that will also be the last one for today. So the neocortex is then the then the, the top, I mean everything uh, around that. You already saw that. Um, it is the newest part of the animal because so far I mean we uh, we had uh, controlling the eye movements, we had uh, memory of places where to go, we had uh, reactions to the environment with our amygdala, I mean pursuing certain things. I mean we already had a lot of, a lot of uh, cognitive power here, but we actually need the neocortex um, as, as a way to balance. The problem is um, or the basic problem, or the, the basic reason why we even have a neocortex, is that um, all those amygdala, etc., react directly to to the environment. So just like you you show a dog a treat and the the dog eats the treat, that's it. Uh, there's no like planning or thinking about the social repercussions. Should you take the treat or shouldn't you take the treat, or an, an analysis or so. There's but. It's just the treat and, and you take it, bam. Uh, or with a, with a fly or something like that, or with a frog, you show a fly and then it just eats the, eats the fly and that's it. Um, but the point of the neocortex is to say, stop, uh, let's not do certain things. Um, and for that, you basically need, um, need a stronger signal than the signal from the amygdala. And um, for example, uh, without the neocortex, you couldn't you couldn't go to the to the, to the dentist, for example, because uh, you couldn't imagine like okay, I take that I take that one pain and to to do away with the other pain, um, or you couldn't go like around around a wall if you know there's there's food behind the wall you couldn't go around the wall you go directly to the wall and try to go directly through the wall to to get to the food and you don't plan to go around the wall because if you go around the wall you first go away from the food uh, and that is not possible if you don't have a neocortex to suppress the the, the need of the amygdala to go directly to the food and yeah, uh, besides that, I mean the whole categorization I already mentioned um, that uh, you have uh, visual signals and you look at you look at certain things and then can identify it as as a tree, as a tiger, as uh, as a car, as a street, as a as a bush bush with berries, as a meal or something like that. That. Uh, abstract definitions is also part of the neocortex um, and of course with the, with the prefrontal cortex uh, at the front that's all the, the planning the modeling I already mentioned um, one theory is the so-called nocturnal bottleneck hypothesis uh, because when the dinosaurs died out uh, before the dinosaurs dinosaurs died out um, all the mammals were, were living uh, in the dark during the night because then the dinosaurs weren't active and their main uh, sense was of course sense of smell and the special thing about the sense of smell is it's not a direct sense i mean if you sense something that could be something that was there five hours ago like a like a uh, another a prey or a predator that was five hours there ago so you don't try to react directly to it Instead, you sniff around and create a map of your environment and deduce from the map where the prey probably is or if it's long gone or if it's still there. So you try to suppress the direct reaction to the, to the sense of smell. So you smell there's a, there's a, there's a predator um, and instead uh, uh, first uh, evaluate the situation and then react to it. And for that, you need the neocortex because you need to suppress the immediate urge of your amygdala to, to hunt the prey 
uh, in, and instead wait and, and, and first determine what is going on. I mean, that is a big part of, let's say, let's say dogs and, and cats, they always try to create a map um, of their environment through, through the sense of smell. And uh, the interesting thing is because we have that indirect uh, or trained our neocortex through that indirect information processing through the sense of smell, we can now also use that uh, ability to um, think about the future or uh, don't uh, or, or save up uh, save up food for the next day and not eat everything right now. So that's all part of that uh, evolution. Without our evolution through the nocturnal bottleneck uh, and throughout our evolution with the sense of smell, we wouldn't have a neocortex today. We couldn't think about the future or the past. So our smell is based, or our sense of smell was basically the uh, the doorway to the um, uh, to to our neocortex, and that is something many non-mammals don't have. They have to react directly to their environment. They can't suppress their immediate urges. Um, that they and uh, they can't basically can't can't reflect or think about alternative actions. Okay. So what's uh, what will be next in the next time? Next time we will look at what's happening basically after the neocortex was developed. And we will look much more closely in the individual parts in the frontal lobe, in the motor cortex, what the difference are, differences are between the uh, between uh, the prefrontal cortex of the chimpanzees and the prefrontal cortex of the of, of humans, and uh, basically what makes us human, and what 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 sm actually small changes in the uh, in the um, neocortex makes us human. In that regard, I'm I'm through, uh, so I'm very open to questions. In YouTube or you in Zoom. Also uh, feedback, because it's the first experiment without looking at actual people in a room. Um, yeah, you're, you're still muted, just if you want to say something. And in YouTube. Okay, um, while you are thinking about questions, so the next, uh, next time is in two weeks. And uh, of course, this video will be available on YouTube for later. Uh, watch uh, next time it will be also a little bit later because I want to have all that a little bit more international so two hours later from six to uh, from from four to six uh, GMT plus one uh, maybe someone from the US can then also look without being too uh, too tired and uh, the article uh, I mean, everything I talked today, at least about evolution, is on my blog. Uh, it's linked on the Meetup website, so you can read up on that. Uh, and it is, of course, everything uh, also in the in the book, uh, with all links to studies, uh, to additional information. You can get there. And if you have any questions while reading it, just uh, let me know, uh, comment on the video. Um, and that is everything I have for today. So. So then, uh, thank you for watching, uh, thank you for your comments, and we will see us in 
two weeks hopefully uh, topic primates difference between humans and primates and maybe if we manage uh, also already the information processing in the brain like this one here looks like a normal picture well maybe not so much <laughs> optical illusions uh, same with I do have another one. Oh well, basic ones like these lines. Here's also pre-processing going on. Lines look curved because the brain looks into the future or tries to predict the future. And if the brain sees like these lines, then the brain thinks, okay, you're moving to a corridor or something like that. So those lines are not actually. Uh, straight lines but curved lines so that's also something that happens before the uh, before arriving at the visual cortex yeah thank you for uh, listening not that much and i can't read it okay uh that's all uh write in the comments uh we see us next time bye